there's a great deal of significance in the social web today, in what's happening uh, in the world. And uh, to actually get started with that, I want to talk about something that's going on actually currently, right now, um, with the Iran elections. Um, how many of you have been following that via social media, the news? Okay. So it's, it's very hard to avoid that. Part of it, of course, is that you know, if you do anything with the social web or if you are on social media and things like that, uh, you've probably run into it somehow. It's simply unavoidable. Of course, um, whoops, there's all kinds of photos that are put up on, on the web that are being taken by citizens um, of Iran. You know, all kinds of crazy, pretty terrible things going on there. Hard to sort of pick out what's actually happening um, given all this stuff, but nonetheless, we're inundated with information in a way that we've never been before. Uh, there's videos, of course, on YouTube being broadcast either by people out of the, the, uh, the opposing campaign that may or may not have lost the, can the election, um, or by individual citizens themselves, because that's how ubiquitous this technology has become. And of course, on the flip side, in the Western world, people have figured out ways of trying to support the cause of the Iranian people um, by dressing up their avatars in green or taking photos of themselves wearing green t-shirts. This is not about Irish, I guess. Uh, it's something else. Um, and one of the interesting things that, that's also happened here is, is the reaction from uh, the Iranian authority to what's happening. Um, and, and of course, they're also able to see all the social media. They're able to see what's actually going on. They're, they're watching these things just as they did uh, all throughout time. And so people have also responded with rules for using social media um, when it comes to these types of protests or speaking out. Um, for example, only use certain hashtags, which I think is fascinating that people are actually coordinating using that thing. Um, they're talking about you know, not broadcasting the proxy addresses publicly. It kind of makes sense. People are, you know, the authorities are blocking uh, various servers, services, and things like that. Um, and never naming a source, you know, all those various things about, about getting the word out there, with, you know, but being safe. Um, and I think what's, what's, what's interesting to note about this is how people are starting to use these channels which were once trivialized as being you know, pretty stupid, like, oh yeah, what are people doing, who cares, as being something actually essential to our public dialogue and discourse, to finding out what's going on. People are convening and organizing themselves through these once were once, you know, again, disposable channels. Um, and so people are going into Facebook, Twitter, these large services, to protest what they felt was a, a corrupt election, and now they're doing this in a way that's global and sustained. And I think that's, that's really interesting to see happen. Of course, we saw some of this with the, the Obama campaign, but now we're seeing it from all the way around the world. So it's not just a uniquely uh, Western phenomenon that's happening. Um, so significant are these, these missives coming from uh, the rest of the world that, of course, you might have heard that, that the State Department supposedly even asked Twitter to reschedule their maintenance time to allow for the Iranians to keep tweeting. And of course, Twitter obliged and said, sure, you know, we'll just move that back you know, six or seven hours so that it happens at 1.30 a.m. Uh, Iranian time as opposed to some Western you know, 3 a.m. period or something like that. So clearly, these channels are becoming very, very important to the public debate. And this isn't the first time either. Um, of course, this is the one that, of course, has gotten a lot more attention and media buzz. But even before that, and, and of course this wasn't the first one either, there was P-Man, which was a bunch of student protesters in Moldova um, using this hashtag, which stands for the Piata Maria, um, something in Romanian, which I can't really say. Um, but the point was they were using this tag, again, to organize themselves uh, in a very emergent way. This wasn't them going to some group, setting up the group, inviting all their friends to join. This was based on sort of a performative action where the medium actually embodied what they were talking about. Um, and of course, it isn't that, that you know, on the one hand, in, in, in Iran, you know, government's doing various things, re reacting and responding to this stuff. But in China, they're also doing things that are more blanket oriented, where they just shut down whole services. They just shut down access altogether. They had sort of an experiment, uh, I think, last summer when there were uh, these earthquakes uh, in China. They let social media sort of, you know, come out, talk about things, and then eventually they got tired of that and they shut that down too. And so this is sort of a big experiment where we're seeing the effects of these things all around the world. But it's not just in places that the Western media likes to think of as repressive. It's actually happening in, in our own sort of neighbors and backyards. Uh, this is a little further away than that, but nonetheless, in Australia, I don't know if you've heard, but they, they have uh, implemented something 
which they talk about here as, as being for protecting Australian families online, um, which is basically a big firewall, like in China, that filters all the internet traffic going to that continent. And so this has had profound effects on the speed of, of internet connectivity. Um, of course, there's been a number of false positives. All the things that you would actually fear that would happen from such a service being in place have happened. And this is happening, again, not in places like China or Iran, where you know, we've been told to expect those types of things, but in places like this. And this, of course, has, has economic consequences. It has consequences on businesses, doing business there. And these are the types of things and stories that other governments around the world are going to look to for success so they can emulate it. And I think that's a really, really bad precedent for a number of reasons. Um, you know, I, I like to sort of quote Thomas Jefferson every now and then. He's, he's got a lot of good quotes. But, you know, he also, among many other things, he said, when the people fear the government, there's tyranny. However, when the government fears their people, there's liberty. And, and this made a lot more sense maybe back in, you know, the time when he was talking about these types of things. But nonetheless, we are seeing governments being very fearful today of social media and of cracking down on it and on using it to find out what's going on with their citizens and in many ways to repress a lot of dissent. And while social media on the one hand has enabled people to have a whole, to experience a whole bunch of new freedoms and ways of connecting with one another around the world to find out what's going on, to engage, now we're seeing a backlash against that because now these governments are actually taking some of this stuff seriously. And so this is something I think that's, that's really timely to think about in the work that we do, in the work that I do as sort of an open source, open web advocate. Um, because it isn't just that governments, which you're sort of brought up to distrust and fear, um, it's not just about them anymore. Because there's actually, I think, a new relationship that's emerging here that's, that's entirely different and unprecedented in many respects. In the place of civic government, what we're seeing, I think, is a new relationship emerging between private companies and individual citizens. And um, commercial interest in the freedom of expression, I think, actually sort of has this awkward and uncomfortable you know, relationship. They like it when they can push messages out that you know, uh, reflect a certain bottom line or a certain sort of values. Um, but in other ways, they might not actually think that it's, it's great for their business. Um, whether that criticism comes at, at their expense or at one of their partners or things like that, they might not be that interested um, in actually supporting it and maintaining it. Um, now, the connection here to something like, like Walmart, you know, giant producer, obviously, and, and, and uh, distributor of many things, um, to, to the social web will come, I think, hopefully over time. Like I said, I'm trying to figure out exactly what I was talking about when I came up with the title of this talk. But I think I actually might pull it off. In this case, we have a company like Walmart plotted against a nice little well-loved service like Flickr. Flickr, of course, owned by Yahoo, one of the larger uh, internet companies of the web. Now, what's interesting about the case of Flickr recently, and I don't know if you saw this, um, was the case of this guy, uh, what was his name? Shepard, Shepard Johnson where his account was banned, deleted, whatever you want to say, uh, from Flickr, from the whole Flickr sphere, because he left some comments on a certain Flickr member's photo stream. That Flickr member, of course, was Barack Obama. And when you leave certain comments um, that, that express a certain dissent or disagreement with a user, and you post photos, I guess, apparently, in this case, of uh, prisoners from Abu Ghraib, um, you know, you, you, you invoke some attention. And so this Flickr user's account was, and all his 1,200 photos and what have you were, were, were deleted, were, were destroyed. Okay, you know, that happens a lot. Or maybe it doesn't happen that much, but it does happen. It's something that's known. You know, if you act out in a certain place and you don't follow what are called community guidelines, which are there to sort of govern a space, then you might end up actually losing your account, losing, you know, that ability to actually access the service. Um, and Flickr's guidelines are actually quite good. They you know, lay out rather clearly, much better than most services, what is and what is not OK when using this service, when operating in this space, when interacting with other community members. The difference, though, and I think this is what's really starting to change, and this is the new relationship that I'm, I'm talking about, is when a service like Flickr starts to become an identity provider. And in this case, last January, or January 2008, not this previous one, the last one, um, 
Flickr started allowing people to use your Flickr account to sign into other services. So if you use, in my case, flickr.com slash factory Joe, I can use that to sign into other services that support OpenID. And in this case, if, if Shepard Johnson's account were deleted off of Flickr, he's now lost access to all those other services and accounts that he used. And so this is a very, very different type of relationship and a very different type of reliance than I think we've seen in many cases. Now, you can call me an identity alarmist or a canary in the coal mine, if you will. Um, but I really want to impress upon the importance here, I think, um, on the social web of that fragile existence of your identity on the web given the services that, that you use to, to support you, to, to provide your identity. Um, this is what I call web citizenship, and it's fraught with peril today because we're so reliant on other services to essentially allow us to exist. And, and this is fundamentally why, I mean, I'm a board member of the, the OpenID Foundation, so that's, you know, my disclaimer, but why I think something like OpenID, which is, a, which, a, which is a decentralized protocol for doing identity on the web, is so essential and so important. And why it's fundamentally a transformational technology. Uh, the stakes here for, for internet identity, I think, are really heating up. There's competition uh, to be your identity provider for all the transactions that you do on the web. And I think that, you know, it's really important to consider the economic value of providing your identity. If we look at what Tim O'Reilly said in, in 2006, when he was defining Web 2.0 and sort of shaping the contours of that, the rules for the space, one of the most important things that he said of all these different things was that lock-in, inhibiting your freedom to move, came from a number of things, but most importantly, owning a namespace. And owning a namespace is, uh, is about particularly having control over something which defines some set of, of objects, or in this case, what I'm talking about, people. And so this is the business that I think a lot of the large social networks are desperately trying to get into. Now, you might ask, well, why should anybody care? It's a perfectly valid question. Um, people seem more or less okay with how things are. Uh, after all, uh, doing identity on the web, um, as, as I've recently discovered, is actually very, very hard. Um, the benefits really aren't obvious or clear to people. Why should they really, you know, worry about it? it? Seems like it's taken care of, not a big deal. I use Gmail or Hotmail or Yahoo or whatever for my email provider. That's been fine, no problem there. Um, and, and, and I think we're, we're, we're struggling to figure out how we can actually demonstrate these, these benefits because we have to have a lot of the value chain actually established before we can start to show this stuff off to people. For example, I think that internet identity actually needs to be easy, convenient, and useful. And a lot of the stuff that we've done today with OpenID, frankly, is not. And so we have this big challenge to work against larger providers, Facebook and so on, uh, to establish why anybody should care about having their own identity, having control over it, or at least having the choice. So, if we look at what's happening, I think, uh, this, this is, of course, sort of interesting. I don't know if you saw this recently, but this is uh, on Facebook.com. This countdown, of course, has gone to zero. This is the username countdown, the land grab, as they called it, um, where they wanted to go from this ID-based system for identity, where you had to use your real name, and Facebook relied on search to provide people accounts uh, or to, to find friends, to one where it's now username-based. So you have some unique ID in that system, just like you did on AOL before, just like you did on Twitter and so on. So while a bunch of people are going out and doing this land grab, trying to grab your name and all these different services, which of course makes some sense, especially if you're in the social web, um, you know, you want to claim your name. The difference is that all these guys here are now going to be essentially vying for possession or dominance over a certain namespace, namely yours. And I think what's, what's really interesting about this, I love this quote, uh, or tweet, I guess, from Dave Morin. Dave Morin is a good friend of mine. He's also the platform manager at Facebook. And what he said was, and this is, when was this? Well, of course, I don't have the absolute date there. But um, shortly after the whole Facebook username thing happened, he said, slash is the new at. Now, of course, that's a really, really nerdy thing to say, uh, which probably made no sense to any of his followers. But What's really significant is, is considering, you know, when I opened my presentation, I said, here, you can find me at Twitter. You can find me at Identica, actually, at this now. Uh, this is what I use. Well, what he's talking about is going from this, which defines a Twitter namespace, to this. All right? And where the value and where the competition, I think, is going to be 
as Dave pointed out in his tweet, he's being very transparent there, is what actually comes before that name. Who is going to own this part of the namespace? And of course, it's not just about Twitter and Facebook, but these are the two sort of prominent ones today that I think are, are worth looking at. Um, until people are, I think, in, in charge of your own namespace, or you just, you know, you pick and choose wherever you go or you have the ability to switch, there will, be con there will continue to be this battle that focuses just on owning that namespace as opposed to just competing on the benefits that they offer to you, the service that they provide you. Which is why I think, again, OpenID is really critical um, in this space where it needs to exist sort of as that alternative that says actually there's something else out there. You don't just have to exist within these large systems. Now, of course you might ask then, well, how do you choose the right identity provider? All right, so you know, maybe I have or haven't convinced you that's not really kosher or uh, important here. Um, you have to figure out, well, actually the bigger question is, well, who represents you? Who do you want to represent you on the web? Does something like this, this is of course Facebook's homepage for me. I get to choose my photo, but they choose the friends that show up there. So guilt by association is something that I have no control over. In this case, Twitter, okay, awesome. Um, all my tweets, but without any context, people probably have no idea what the heck I'm talking about or why this is important again, right? Um, this is not exactly representative of my identity, but of course, because Twitter owns that namespace, they're increasingly becoming more relevant in search. So when someone Googles you or bings you, I guess, uh, do you want this to be found? Do you want your Facebook page to be found? What does it mean to be the authority of your own name on the web? You know, I can't claim that this is the best website ever. It's certainly not. The HTML is really pretty, all right? But this is my homepage, and I have complete and utter control over it. I can put whatever I want here. So I can provide whatever context I want. I can change this later. I don't need to ask anybody's permission. And for me, that's really, really important. You know, I also, by the way, this is, this is factoryjoe.com, I also use this domain as my open ID. And so I've actually chosen to own my own namespace. And so when I go to the rest of the web and I identify myself, not only am I saying this is me and reflecting that over and over again, but now when people go back and they trace that identity back somewhere, they get something that I have control over, that I decide how it looks. So, Again, I guess we've got to go back to why anybody should care, why this is important and relevant right now. And I think it's because, finally, with the spread of technology, we're at the point where people really should be caring a lot more about their identity on the web. Because a lot of other people really are. I mean, there was a story uh, just a day or two ago where people are not looking at paper resumes anymore. If you send something in an envelope, they'll kind of look at it and be like, what the hell is this? You want me to open this stupid thing? Like, I'm just going to Google you. And if you don't own your identity and you're relying on someone else to do that for you, that other organization is in charge of the first impression that you make. And what that means, again, is that I think we're actually moving through the steps of, of Maslow's hierarchy of needs. Like I said, it's a little philosophical. We're getting to the point now where we're actually starting to see people self-actualize through the web, through their relationships, through their connections, through the things that they do online. And I think this is a big, significant shift. Because people used to sort of throw away the web, say, eh, you know, whatever, yeah, I've got a you know, MySpace page, who cares? You know, I'll just throw it out when I, when I don't need it anymore. Um, and I just don't think that it's good enough. It's not going to be good enough. It's going to be increasingly important, I think. And so the way that this sort of ties together, I think, and, and this is sort of my stretch, sort of you know, trying to deal with this, we've got our biological needs met down at the bottom, right? Our physiological needs are basically met. Um, you know, belonging to a collective sort of, you know, provides us with, with some safety, some security. Uh, we, we find ways of belonging to, with one another in our cultures, civilizations, and so on. Um, of course, through those relationships and connections, we have our esteem all the way up the, the, the chain pyramid um, where we operate on a much higher order of being. Now, of course, all of that is predicated on this base level here, which surprisingly or not surprisingly actually gets us into the supermarkets, which is cool. Our physiological needs are being met at that base level of the pyramid by organizations like Whole Foods or Safeway or I don't know what the local ones here are, but whatever. These large, you know, super large supermarkets. Now, the connection that I want to make today, which I'm, I'm, I'm trying here, is between something like this and something like this, okay? So these are services that are provided to you where you don't need to worry about where this stuff comes from or how it works you can just go there, shop there, all your needs are taken care of, and you don't need to think too hard about it. That's great. All right? 
But I'm not so sure if this should be left up to just Facebook and Twitter and their ilk. I think that there's a place for the individual in this. So while it's fine for some people, I think, to live in the high rises, certainly an attractive opportunity, you know? You've got the gym in the first floor, you've got all the food taken care of, you know, all your uh, you know, pet care needs are taken care of. I still think that there's, there's a need for something a little more local, uh, a little more pedestrian, if you will, but that operates on what I would consider the human scale that allows you to walk down the sidewalk, you know, meet your friends, see your friends, and actually know who your neighbors are in a more direct way, as opposed to being intermediated by these large networks. Now, it could be because I'm old-fashioned or something, uh, but I just think that this is really important to me. It could be, you know, probably actually, considering where I'm from, and this is really hard to read, but it does say, I'm actually not from Vermont, I'm from New Hampshire, the one that's spooning with Vermont. Um, and, 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 and of course, New Hampshire is a very small state. We've probably almost been eaten up many times. Most of the time, people are like, oh, you're from New Hampshire, right? That's like that city in Vermont. I'm like, no. And what that, what that means is that I've grown up sort of as in this pit bull of a, of a state where we have to constantly you know, think that we're bigger than we really are, which leads us to having these awesome slogans on our license plate, you know, live free or die. Of course, you know, Oregon is sort of a sister city in some ways, uh, since you guys don't have sales tax either. Um, so you, you have a sense for the type of freedom that's important to me. <laughs> now, ironically enough, of course, I live in San Francisco now, which is a suburb of the largest, uh, most populous state in the nation, the most bankrupt state as well. Um, and so I'm sort of at odds with, with living in one of the large kind of Facebook states, but coming from my own little open ID provider in the corner. Um, still, growing up in New Hampshire, we had to read people like this. This is uh, Ralph Waldo, Waldo Emerson. Uh, we also read stuff from uh, Henry David Thoreau. Um, and, and these guys started a movement called Transcendentalism. And it was a rather idealistic movement, but it was about making a point. And it wasn't about the specifics. But it was about talking about what's going on around them and trying to provide some insights into, well, look, the way that things are, this industrial society that we have, is not the only way that it has to be. So Emerson wrote this, this book uh, called Self-Reliance. Of course, maybe you can start to see where this is going. Um, they essentially were advocating for freedom, you know, of the, the, the Thomas Jefferson sort, um, that libertarian sort of idealism that, of course, comes from New Hampshire, which is not always practical and doesn't always work for everybody, but still is relevant to keep in the room, even if it's sort of annoying and yappish. Um, I guess it's like me. Um, so regardless of, you know, the strange foibles of that movement, I think, um, it's useful to learn from their example, from what they did. They, you know, they went out, they lived on this, well, I think Thoreau lived on this pond um, in, in Concord, Massachusetts, sort of just to prove a point that he could live sort of off of civilization. Turns out he was like three doors down from his parents' house, but you know, whatever. It was, it was symbolic. It was a gesture, you know? Um, and and, and you, it's not worth evaluating what they talked about in absolute terms. It's more about the relative terms. It's about thinking about individuality and independence and what we sacrifice in terms of gaining some sort of convenience. So, Good example of this. I mean, I love shopping at Whole Foods. I mean, I'm not a great cook, so I rely on them to do a lot of my preparation. I can't go kill, le like, celery. I don't know how. Um, so I'm, I'm basically useless. I mean, I would die if there weren't supermarkets. And so I, I recognize this, and I recognize that I'm not really self-reliant when it comes to relying on these things. However, you know, just because they make our lives so much easier doesn't mean that we shouldn't forget where we came from and the skills that you need to actually survive without them. So. They take care of all this stuff down here for us, these supermarkets. They take care of our physiological needs, and that allows us to operate at a much higher order. We can focus on all this stuff up here, where all the culture and good stuff sort of happens. Which I think is kind of interesting. Now, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm actually moving at the end of the month across town in San Francisco to Dolores Park, where I'm actually gonna have something like a garden for the first time in like 10 years. And I have no idea what I'm gonna do with it. It's like got dirt in it. Dirt, okay. but. What I'm hoping to do is sort of learn, you know, a little bit more about, you know, what it means to be a little more self, you know, reliant, to, to be able to, as I sort of talk about in identity matters, be able to take care of some of my own needs, just so I can sort of play with it, just so I can see what it's like. Because I actually think that it's really important, especially where we're going as a civilization and all the challenges that are ahead. If we rely far too much on all these larger organizations outside of our control, then we really are going to be completely reliant upon them before long. Now, a lot of this might seem kind of esoteric, and I agree it is. I mean, we're talking about the web. 
but I am, I am trying to get somewhere, I think. Um, you know, and, and maybe, maybe once you start growing your own identity on the web, you might realize that identity, I think, is actually the platform for the social web. And I think this is really, really interesting because we have things like the Facebook platform and we have the MySpace ID platform and we've got all these other things, open social. But all those are predicated on those services being the platform. Why can't I be a platform? Why can't I build things upon the things that I do and upon the people that I know? And this is actually the foundation of this project that I started a little while ago called the Dizo Project. And the Dizo Project is short for distributed social networking. The idea being that you should be able to connect to people on your own or connect with people who live in the high rises because that's really important. It needs to be there as just part of the architecture of the web. And so what we're doing is we're essentially deriving standards, formats, protocols, from looking at the trends that are actually going on in these large spaces and turning them into more or less standards, reusable technological building blocks to make it easier and lower cost to build these features that people really like, but then to do them off-site, elsewhere. So we have a bunch of components for the project today. Um, we sort of loosely play in these different areas, but for the rest of my talk, I'm going to focus just today on activity streams. Um, I already talked about identity and profile and stuff, and you can sort of find out about the other stuff if you go to the website. Interestingly enough, um, this guy, Clay Shirky, gave a talk at the, the State Department. Like I said, governments are getting very interested in social media. Um, and, and he made a very, I think, he always makes you know, pretty poignant points. Um, but he, he was talking about how the web, the internet, our communications channels today are becoming global, social, ubiquitous, and cheap, which means that we're seeing rapid shifts in power structures. And so we saw examples of this, of course, we still are, in the Iranian election, in the Moldova protest, in uh, the earthquakes in China. And I think a side effect of this is that the mediums through which we communicate are, are, are changing rapidly. Now, so of course, as, as uh, Marshall McLuhan pointed out decades earlier, the medium, in fact, is a good deal of the message. Um, because the form of the medium itself actually embeds the message. The hashtag is actually a big part of that. It's about communicating, convening, using that channel and using the semantics of that channel to be more powerful. So what we're seeing as well in this, this change in the medium is going from static content to real-time content. Uh, we're moving away from sort of these, these posts that just sit, you know, sat there, these, these static home pages, to what Dave Weiner has called you know, the river of news. And so this is the medium essentially known as a stream, but I think um, a better way to understand what the stream is is to think of it as, as an activity stream of what you're doing. Right? So, so this, this fundamental medium is called the stream. Now, in the Diesel Project, we've endeavored to model the stream of activities of what people are doing on the web with a format that represents these things. And what they, what they represent, or what it represents so far, is essentially very, very basic things. Actor, who did something, verb, what they did, and the object that was either created or changed as a result of that action. The reason why this format is interesting, I think, is because the, the, the feed formats, the news feed formats of the last five or 10 years were built during a time and designed during a time when what most people were doing were writing posts. They were writing blog posts. These blog posts sat on you know, some individual blog and you would subscribe to them in some reader. And that was fine because that's what people did. They just wrote posts. It was like having public email. Great, neat. However, not everybody writes blog posts anymore. They do a lot more interesting things. And in order to actually capture the richness of the content and media types that people are creating today, we need better formats that actually represent those things, that actually build on what's come before. So activity streams itself is actually an extension to the Atom format. It allows a website, like you know, any website really that has social uh, activity, to syndicate their content out to the rest of the web and identify those three basic things. And we're of course adding a few other layers you know, of indirection and so on, but, but that's, that's basically the point and that's where it starts. So what's interesting I think too is even though this effort's just over a year old, we're already seeing some very interesting adopters. Um, MySpace actually adopted and rolled this out uh, in March. Facebook followed soon thereafter. So if you actually go through and look at their activity stream stuff, they're using our format. And surprisingly, I, I don't know, I don't expect anybody reads my blog, but um, I kind of 
gave a crap on uh, Opera the other day because they launched this new server in the browser called Unite. This is actually a very interesting idea. I didn't like parts of their marketing, but whatever. It turns out that they're actually using activity streams as well. So we've got some large social networks actually adopting this format. And we've got browsers also looking at this. So what's interesting is that we're actually seeing both sides of the pipe being, being upgraded, in a sense. And I should also point out that the Diesel project itself is predicated on building plugins and extensions to platforms like WordPress, Drupal, Movable Type, the types of software that people actually use today to power their individual websites. So that's sort of the, the, the foundation work. So while we're getting the large providers to adopt this stuff, which I think is very, very critical to seeing wider spread adoption, to lowering those costs, the barrier to getting this stuff out there, we're also building plugins for all these different uh, platforms. And how I think this will play out is through, and why they're actually adopting this stuff is, is because of, of the benefits of social discovery. So if you can syndicate what someone's doing on a website, that becomes a way for offering other people a way to emulate those behaviors and actions. So of course, Facebook has tried this a number of different ways. Their applications spit out these stupid feeds, so-and-so poked so-and-so, or someone threw a sheep at whatever. But part of it is actually discovering what people are doing, what applications are actually going on. You'll see this a lot more, I think, in the iPhone. I think people are going to be playing games on the iPhone. They're going to be challenging their friends. They're going to be syndicating out their high scores or whatever. And you're going to be like, wow, dude, that's a great high score. How do I get that game? An interesting uh, example of this, I think it's sort of you know, abstract maybe again, but, but there's this game called uh, Katamari Damacy. Um, and, and basically you have this character who is obscured by all the things that he's collected, who goes around and collects things by adhering those things to his body. So he just rolls around like the environment. I don't even get it, it's so awesome, it's just great. And all I do is they go, like the next scene probably here is he's gonna pick up these cows like attached to a body, you know, whatever. Um, this is a great example of what's actually happening on the web today. So you go out there, you do all these various things, and all these things accrue on your profile over time. So your activity stream becomes just like this. It's not really round, but you know, you get the idea. And this is, this is I think, really critical because it turns out that who you are is actually a function of what you do and who you know. I mean, it's you know, very, very basic, but I think these are the, 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 the basic you know, pieces, the building blocks for sort of like the social web. And it, and it turns out that, that all this activity stuff, this activity stream stuff, maps back to some academic, esoteric type of thing called activity theory. And I'm not gonna get into this because it's, you know, there's papers and stuff written on this and I don't have attention spans to read those things. But the point is, there's information out there that talks about how the activity theory applies really well and maps to the social web. And so if you're building services for the web, you're thinking about interfaces, you're thinking about user flows, this stuff is actually very, very powerful because this models the way that people behave. It talks about why and what motivates them to do different things. And it talks about you know, the rules, the, the community, all these different things that sort of shape the nature of behavior in a space. And of course, part of this is, is to consider what the social objects are in whatever application you're building. Those social objects are the things around which people gather, those objects in Katamari, I guess, uh, that cling to people, that provide opportunities to connect, to converse, to convene, whether it's a hashtag or a photo on Flickr. And so building social software requires you to identify both the activity that will go on in your space, but also the objects around which people will interact. And so if we go back to the Dizo project, I think one of the ideas is to sort of take activity stream, activity theory, identity, develop a model for how distributed social networking will actually work and play out, develop the user flows, the use cases, the arguments for and why this stuff actually matters or why it's useful or valuable, how it lowers the cost to actually serving people with their social needs. And think about how the individual plays a role as the fundamental actor in this system. So while I certainly am not advocating for the abolition of Whole Foods, I would die, I would starve, you know, in like five minutes. I think it's, it's really important to think about how reliant upon these types of supermarkets we are today in our own functioning, in the way that our civilization functions. I mean, there'd be mass chaos, of course, as we saw in Katrina, um, you know, when food supply was cut off. And so while it might not be quite the same degree of, of, of chaos if a service like you know, Facebook went down, nonetheless, as we rely more and more on these types of services for things like our identity and allowing us to express who we are to the rest of the web, we have to think very critically about that relationship and about the responsibilities that they have to us as their web citizens. And so this is all predicated, at least the way that I think about this, 
with competing on the open web as opposed to competing with it, which of course Microsoft has tried to do for a long time and maybe is sort of changing their behavior a little bit. But as Eric Schmidt said, of course, you know, don't fight the internet. The internet is bigger than all of us. It's bigger than all the social networks out there. It's actually the largest social network that exists. And I think that while this is true and this network is insanely massive, and this is taken like 99 or something like that, so obviously this has grown quite a bit. This is the map of the internet, by the way. Um, what's really important to me is that there are individuals as nodes and as actors in this much larger ecosystem. So I'm ending early, so that means we have time for conversation and discussion. Um, that's all I got. So thanks for listening. I'll also point out that uh, this afternoon from 1 to 5, there's going to be a Dezo hack session. So if you want to actually install some of the Dezo plugins, right now mostly in WordPress and movable type, uh, we'll be hanging out. I'll be hanging out, um, working on my blog over at the Hilton in Portland, uh, and so on, blah, 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 in the Hacker Lounge. So questions or comments or disagreements or things like that? So, so the question is about what the role the federal government, at least in the U.S. case, uh, might play in either regulating these things or, you know, sort of figuring out. Obviously, they're, they're, they've, they've taken an interest. There's, a, there's an important stuff going on here, as I've talked about. Um, what role does the federal government have in this stuff? And I think, fortunately, we actually have a president that is, you know, digitally savvy enough to maybe not fuck it all up. We'll see. However, I do think that they're very eager to figure out the right way of doing social media. And I also think that this relationship that the individual citizen has to these companies is one that actually, in some ways, imperils the uh, proper functioning of the government. Now, I've, I've, I've changed my thinking personally a little bit about the role of the government, the way the government operates, um, even in the last six months. Because I recognize, and I'm starting to realize, maybe it is with a new president or whatever, that the government is actually made up of independent, independent and individual citizens. And if we want to see a lot more you know, government use of things like open source or technologies that we think are actually the proper ones to use, the ones that don't create lock-in, that actually means that we have to participate and give the government a lot more information, a lot more ideas about how to properly approach these things. So to your question, um, I think that the government is receiving a lot of input from companies like Google and Facebook. I don't know how much input they're receiving from independent citizens who care about things like social media or identity. I mean, I'm talking to the government in some ways, and I'm trying to tell them what I think, but I'm just one independent citizen. So it would help if there were more people talking about them, they were talking to them, to help them put into to context and perspective the value and importance of identity on the web and how the government might need to come in at some point. I mean, I'm a big you know, free market you know, enthusiast, but at the same time, the free market fucks up a lot. You know, uh, phone number portability, for example, is a good example where the government's done some good. Um, where you know, maybe there has to be some sort of guaranteed uptime, or maybe you have to have a guaranteed connection to the web. Maybe you know, broadband that's ubiquitous um, to all citizens is something that the government should aspire to offer somehow. Maybe they don't provide it themselves, but maybe they go about actually creating the incentives and motivators to make that happen. So I don't think that there's a great answer to that question yet, but I do hope that people start to think about this more critically and then provide feedback and advice and guidance to help the government make more sense of what's happening. Yep. And I think of it in terms of even physical identity. I like somebody's driver's license or somebody's passport, or if somebody shows me their homemade business card, I don't put a lot of value behind that, right? Sure. So, so they're, they're, How do you deal with that in a digital way? So the question is, is kind of around um, third party identity, um, what we would call maybe claims based or attribute based identity, um, or just even you know, through someone else having verification or identity sort of established. And there, there are two responses that I have to that. I think first is, that I'm actually a big proponent, and I think one of the best features of OpenID is what's called delegation. So you might own your own domain name. You, know, you paid for it with your own money from GoDaddy or whatever, great. You set it up, and what you do is you actually point to some other third-party identity provider that deals with all the security for you. And so you know, my former employer, Vadoop, uh, tried doing some of this stuff. Um, 
And the people that used it and used it with delegation were able to, of course, point their open ID to somebody else once it turned out that the company wasn't doing so well, um, you know, without missing a beat. And third parties had no idea you know, that, that things had changed. As long as you can prove that you own the, the address or whatever, with, with the case of OpenID, great. Now, part of it is also, I think, that, 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 that's missing from this is how an individual could also vouch for other people, for their friends, through the social graph. So if you want to know whether or not, you know, your neighbor is trustworthy or whatever, maybe there's a relationship that you have with that neighbor and through a friend connection that you've exposed to the web and said, you know, you're connected to this person, you're friends with them, sort of like your LinkedIn profile or even on Twitter, you know, you have all the people that you follow there. That's a way of actually representing identity in a way that's social. So that's another part of it that I think we haven't explored enough, which is how peers can actually create either trust networks or just expose a trust graph. Finally, maybe the third point is that I think that there will be you know, Gravatar is probably the dumbest, simplest example that you can provide for understanding how um, reputation type services might actually operate. So Gravatar is a service that provides a global unique avatar for people based on your email address. So if you leave a comment on my blog and you provide your email address, WordPress will basically go ask Gravatar, hey, here's a hash of this email address that we got. Do you have some icon for this person? Well, there's no reason why you couldn't use a very similar type of thing with OpenID or with email address that goes to some you know, reputation provider like LinkedIn and says, by the way, does this person work at this company? Or does this person have this? Or is this person over 18, for example, in the case of government? So there's absolutely a role for that to happen. Um, the web technology that we have today is very basic. There's a lot more complex types of security and identity technology out there. The challenge right now is actually getting out of this stuff widely adopted so that people actually use it. So that's the challenge that we're sort of running into. But absolutely, I think that that whole idea that you just described is something that's definitely part of this ecosystem. What's the current state of laws around protecting its citizens from our government accessing our, our social media activity, both public and private? So, for example, um, you know, I know there's only so many companies that have access to the, the Twitter fire hose. Um, how do we find out? How do we know if our government actually was tapping into Um, the simple, well, the first answer is I'm not a lawyer. The second and third parts uh, is that, one, in some cases you don't know because of the FISA stuff. So the government actually has the ability to go and, you know, listen to AT&T's phone calls and messages or whatever without letting you know, uh, which is a big problem. Um, but then there's, there's just rules around warrants in general. So I think that there are rules around rating servers and things like that uh, to get access to your data or whatever. But it's, it's, it's largely unclear. If anybody else has more information, please correct me. Um, and I think, for the most part, the government can do whatever they want with public data, which is you know, a lot of stuff out there. Um, whether or not there's like a feed being piped you know, to the FBI from Facebook, I have no idea. And I don't know how we'd know that. Um, that would be something, I guess, to ask a senator or whatever to find out you know, and maybe do some FOIA request or whatever. It's, but it's, yeah, it's all part of the same thing, though. I mean, and they're, so clearly they want to get access to that information. Whether or not useful information could be gleaned from that is a big open question. Um, but yeah, they definitely are interested in that, just like all the other governments. Of course, our government has a lot more stru strictures. And so in many cases, actually, it's interesting. The government, our government, is fearful of actually engaging with a lot of social media because of all the red tape they have to go through if they collect any personally identifying information. Now, of course, there are groups that are probably exempt from that, the FBI, CIA, and so on. But that creates sort of an interesting you know, parallel reality where the government agencies that want to serve you don't want to take your information. Or they want to make it really hard for you because it's really hard for them, whereas the ones that you're worried about uh, have very different rules applied to them. So unfortunately, I'm not an expert in this case. Other questions? So, uh, you had a question? Or over in here? No? Other, yeah? No? Sure, sure. Uh, it's a very good question. Um, one of the reasons why I thought Vadoop was interesting was because I felt that if you're going to be representing your own identity and hosting your own identity, that you should also have ways of securing that identity. And today, it's actually very hard to do that. Um, 
However, there are ways of you know, using biometrics or using you know, phone call verification or SMS notifications and things like that to secure your identity on the web. And so I think that eventually over time as we recognize the value and importance of these accounts, there will be two things that happen. First is that there will be services, I think, that will crop up that allow you to better secure your identity. Um, but second, I think that there will be better heuristics that allow us to prevent fraud and bad things from happening in the first place. So already, um, you know, Google, Facebook, Yahoo, all these guys ha employ a very large number of very strange algorithms that help them to detect when things are happening to your account that aren't being done by you. And whether that's based on your IP address, your geolocation, based on the time of day when you're trying to log in, all these different things can cause second tier authentication mechanisms to kick in that basically are saying, okay, you don't seem like the person that we think you are because you're behaving differently. Therefore, we're going to close down your account and if it's a good identity provider, they'll get in touch with you personally or go through some other channel to verify that the activity that's actually taking place is you. Banks and credit cards are really good at doing this today. And I think eventually we're going to see the same value um, put into a lot of our social media data you know, with that history over time, the whole uh, Katamari you know, character over time, where you want to actually protect that stuff and secure it. And you want to have a partner in that to help you actually do that better. But sort of the whole point that I'm making here is that it's very important that you actually have choice in who your identity provider is. So if you get stuck with a namespace based on facebook.com, you won't have choice. You will have to use your Facebook account ad infinitum, just as all those people have really bad AOL Instant Messenger screen names, continually have to use those names forever, because that's what they got when they got it. I would recommend that. Um, I think that that's the best way to make sure, especially as this space is rapidly changing um, and, and we're not at sort of a standstill yet. There's lots of various things that are happening. So the best way to sort of, I think, you know, guard against that unknown future is to sort of control it yourself for now, to buy a domain and then do delegation. You know, once things sort of settle down and you know, we know who the Visa card, you know, Visa MasterCard providers are gonna be for identity on the web, okay, great. You know, if you want to sort of defer to them for the rest of your life, okay. I mean, I'm not going to tell you not to. I think that's perfectly fine for a lot of people. But I think that in the, in the way that things are, are shaking out now, if you care about these things, it is sort of important to sort of buy your own domain, own your own real estate in a sense, to stake out a plot on the web. Because, you know, there's a lot of domain names out there that you can still get. Um, and there's going to be more as they're opening up the, uh, the TLD namespace. And also, I, said, I guess on that point is, you know, to some degree, who you come from or where you start at says something about you. So if a MySpace user leaves a blog comment on my blog using their MySpace ID, which is also an open ID, that says something about them versus someone that uses a Facebook ID or a Twitter ID, no ID at all. And so that's also sort of important. If you're actually owning your own domain, again, you become the authority for what I can know about you. Any other questions? All right. Happy to adjourn. Thank you.